A reading from the first book of Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem, for I have chosen my king from among his sons. As Jesse and his sons came to the sacrifice, Samuel looked at Elab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is here before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not judge from his appearance or from his lofty stature, because I have rejected him. Not as man sees does God see, because man sees the appearance, but the Lord looks into the heart. In the same way, Jesse presented seven sons before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, The Lord has not chosen any one of these. Then Samuel asked Jesse, Are these all the sons you have? Jesse replied, There is still the youngest who is tending the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send for him. We will not begin the sacrificial banquet until he arrives here. Jesse sent and had the young man brought to them. He was ruddy, a youth handsome to behold, and making a splendid appearance. The Lord said, There, anoint him, for this is the one. Then Samuel, with the horn of oil in hand, (coughs) anointed David in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. table before me in the sight of my foes. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall want. Only goodness and kindness follow me days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord for years to come. The Lord is my shepherd, there is nothing I shall A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Ephesians. Brothers and sisters, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Live as children of light, for light produces every kind of goodness and righteousness and truth. Try to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the fruitless works of darkness. Rather expose them, 
For it is shameful even to mention the things done by them in secret. But everything exposed by the light becomes visible. For everything that becomes visible is light. Therefore it says, Awake, O slipper, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Ebum Domini. Dominus Fobiscum et cum spiritus tuo. Lexio Sancti Evangelii secundum Ioannem. Gloria Tibi Domine. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned? this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made clay with the saliva, and smeared the clay on his eyes, and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed, and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier as a beggar said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said it is, but others said, No, he just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, how were your eyes opened? He replied, the man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed and was able to see. And they said to him, where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one who was once blind to the Pharisees. Now Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on a Sabbath. So then the Pharisees also asked him how he was able to see. He said to them, he put clay on my eyes and I washed and now I can see. So some of the Pharisees said, this man is not from God because he does not keep the Sabbath. But others said, how can a sinful man do such signs? And there was a division among them. So they said to the blind man again, what do you have to say about him since he opened your eyes? He said, he is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. They asked them, is this your son who you say was born blind? How does he now see? His parents answered and said, we know that this is our son and that he was born blind. We do not know how he sees now, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age. He can speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, 
he would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said to him, he is of age, question him. So a second time they called the man who had been blind and said to him, give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, if he is a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was blind and now I see. So they said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I told you already and you did not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to become his disciples too? They ridiculed him and said, you are that man's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, this is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he listens to him. It is unheard of that anyone ever opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he would not be able to do anything. They answered and said to him, you were born totally in sin, and are you trying to teach us? Then they threw him out. When Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, he found him and said, do you believe in the Son of Man? He answered and said, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped him. Then Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see, those who do not see might see, and those who do see might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard this and said to him, surely we are not also blind, are we? Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sin remains. Verbum Domini, Two major themes in the readings and at Mass today are joy and light. Today we're celebrating Laetare Sunday, which means rejoice. There's reason to rejoice as Easter is approaching quickly. We're already midway through the season of Lent. We're coming upon the great celebration of our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection in just three short weeks. And the entrance antiphon for Mass today Likewise begins with rejoice, Jerusalem, and all who love her. Be joyful, all who were mourning, who were in mourning. And on this day, as it probably certainly stands out, rose vestments are worn for the Mass. There are only two Sundays that these rose vestments are worn. Laetare Sunday, today the fourth Sunday in Lent, and Gaudete Sunday, the third Sunday in Advent. Again, these, both of these Sundays really emphasize a joyful anticipation of the great feasts that are approaching. Of course, in Advent, we prepare for that great feast of our Lord's birth. Now again, we're preparing for the Paschal mystery, culminating in the resurrection and ascension of our Lord. But in the first reading from Samuel today, we're reminded of a very important truth, that not as man sees does God see. We see appearances, but God looks into the heart. Even Samuel the prophet, remember who had been very attentive to the Lord even as a boy, he was wakened by the Lord's voice calling him, Samuel. And then he went back after Eli told him and said, Speak, Lord, for thy servant is listening. So he was attentive to the voice of God, yet even in today's reading he was mistaken because when he was sent to go choose to anoint the king, he mistakenly thought it was one of Jesse's older sons. But the Lord corrected him. It's not those, not the ones that appear to be suitable. And who would have thought the Lord would have chosen the youngest, a shepherd boy, David, to become king? 
But what's important to get from this is that he was chosen and called by God. It wasn't due to his natural talents or his background. God freely chose him. We can think of our Lord's words as well. You did not choose me, I chose you. We know that God again has a plan for each and every one of us to grow in holiness, to grow in virtue. And he certainly can make use of us who are weak. And he often does, as the weaker we are, it gives him greater honor and glory. It shows that he does the work and not us. All we have to do is cooperate. So what God sees and does goes much deeper than what we see on the surface. And regardless of how weak we are or how unlikely one may seem to carry out God's work, God chooses the unexpected, and he gives them the grace to fulfill the mission that he's given. And for our part, we simply open our hearts to the surprises that God has planned in our lives. I know Pope Francis has spoken about this on several occasions, to be open to the surprises that God has planned for us. Today's psalm is one of the most familiar that we hear and often brings comfort and consolation to those who are suffering or going through trials. Psalm 23, the Lord is our shepherd who tends his flock with care. And in our Catholic tradition too, we see that there's a lot of sacramental imagery in Psalm 23. There's baptism. Beside restful waters, he leads me. He refreshes my soul. We also hear you anoint my head with oil. Baptism and in confirmation, our heads are anointed with the chrism, with oil. There's also imagery of the Holy Eucharist. We see the green pastures where the shepherd leads his flock to feed upon as spiritual food, the Holy Eucharist. We also hear about the preparation of a table and a cup that overflows. Again, so there's this Eucharistic imagery. So looking at seeing the sacramental imagery in the psalm, it's a good reminder as well that God continues to nourish and strengthen us with the sacraments through the church. And especially in the second, as I mentioned, the two major themes today are joy and light. In the second reading in the gospel, the dominant themes are light. St. Paul urges the Ephesians to live as children of light, to reflect the light of Christ that we first received in baptism. We're not to hide the light of faith, but to let it shine before the world. It's not always comfortable living our faith, but this is what we're called to do, to live it out joyfully. And if we might be tempted to think that we can't make a difference or what difference can we make, St. John Chrysostom encourages us. He says, do not say I cannot help others. If you are truly a Christian, it is impossible for you not to be able to do so. If we act properly, everything else will follow as a natural consequence. Christian's light cannot be hidden. A lamp so brilliant cannot fail to be seen. Again, the way we live our lives does have an effect on other people. We're called to joyfully live it out. In the gospel, of course, we hear of our Lord curing or healing the man born blind. And that blind man stands for every single one of us. We were born spiritually blind because of original sin. And just as that man went and washed in the pool of Siloam and was healed, he was able, he came back able to see we, likewise, washed in baptism, receive the light of faith, and were enlightened by Christ, by the light of Christ. The gospel, it's a very uh, lengthy one today, but it also touches upon spiritual blindness and also the presumed link between sin and suffering. As we know, the Pharisees, who could see naturally, were blind spiritually because they hardened their hearts in unbelief. Clearly, a miracle had just occurred before them, and they chose, but despite seeing this miracle, witnessing this, they freely chose to reject the grace of Christ. They refused to accept it. They freely chose to remain spiritually blind. You know, uh, Blessed John Paul II once said that when we meet or encounter Christ, there is only one of two options. We either accept him or we reject him. There's no other alternative. And so are we open to the light of Christ? And by accepting him and his grace, allowing him into our hearts, that transforms us. It gives us light, gives us peace and joy. 
And of course, this gospel also addresses that presumed thought that suffering and sickness are the direct result of our own personal sin. It's true that suffering can be linked to our sin, but that's not always necessarily the case. I think this, is, this thought is particularly prevalent in the Old Testament. It's thought that the sufferings we go through is due to our own personal sins, what we've done. An exception, of course, from this is we see in the example of Job. He was righteous, and yet God permitted great suffering in his life. And we see that thought as well in the gospel, in the very opening of the gospel. When they said, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And what was the answer? Neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. So for our own lives during times of sickness or trial or suffering, whatever we're going through, we should not worry whether it's due to something we just committed, a sin that we just committed. It's useless to worry. Our Lord said very clearly, which of you by being anxious could add one cubit to a span of life? What should we do? Simply embrace the cross. We don't have to know the reason. We should repent of our sins, but we embrace the cross and offer it to him. We know our Lord conquered the power of sin and death by his own passion, death, and resurrection. But notice that through his passion, he didn't do away with human suffering. He could have if he wanted to, but he didn't. Rather, he redeemed suffering. He transformed suffering. So now, thanks be to God, we are able to unite our sufferings with his. And we can see suffering as a means to sanctity, to grow in holiness. We know and we're called to imitate that. We know, again, when our Lord transformed suffering, suffering entered into a new dimension, that of love. And blessed John Paul II said again that love is the fullest source of the answer to the question of the meaning of suffering. Again, love. So we seek to embrace our sufferings, the crosses, with love and to unite that with the Lord. So with redemptive suffering, and when we unite our sufferings with the sufferings of Christ, great good can come out because of it. And St. Paul understood this very well. That's why he said, I rejoice in my sufferings for your sake. We can offer our sufferings in reparation for our past sins. We can offer them for family members, relatives, loved ones, maybe those who have fallen away from the faith, no longer practice their faith. Suffering can also bring conversion in our own lives. Sometimes it takes hitting rock bottom and we seem to have lost everything. We're suffering tremendously before we realize that we need God's grace. We need him. We're not in control of our lives. So it can bring about conversion. And it really helps to keep our priorities straight too. Because when we're suffering, everything that the world has to offer doesn't seem so appealing anymore. It helps us to keep, okay, I'm here to please God. And it can actually increase our desire for heaven, where all suffering, sorrow, and sadness will be wiped away. And perhaps most importantly, again, through suffering, and by embracing the cross, again, is this is an opportunity to be more closely united with Christ. As we have just three weeks to go before we celebrate our Lord's passion, death, and resurrection at Easter, in which he redeemed us from our sins, May we be joyful witnesses of our faith and truly continue to live on as children of light.